Okay, so um, complementing uh, what Dr. Grossbard is doing, I'm going to do a little bit on leukemia with the understanding of um, what the problems are, and also because it's a lay, uh, lay group, uh, trying to spread the word how um, we uh, need people to donate. Um, to at least be checked to see if they are, are uh, matches for transplant. I'll explain all of that as we do this. So the first thing, which again complements what was said already, this is just a, um, yeah, where's the thing here? Uh, this is a, a list of cancers, Anna, and um, you can see that the big ones are lung and uh, uh, large, or colon cancer, um, representing uh, 20, 25 percent of all each of them. Um, also in females, breast cancer. And then there's a host of cancers that are much less common. Uh, by the way, can you hear me? Okay. Um, and uh, But for the purposes of what uh, Dr. Uh, Grossbard showed you, that maybe five to ten, ten, seven percent of all cancers are non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And um, uh, less common, but not that far along, um, is leukemia. And there are a variety of leukemias. I'm going to be talking about acute leukemia versus chronic ones, which have great advances, but I, just for purposes of transplant, we'll go to that. Um, and the other complementary thing that I want to mention is something you read about all the time is what's called the pluripotential stem cell. You know, when they talk about stem cells that are going to repopulate the world, so to speak. Stem cells are present in the bone marrow, they're present elsewhere, and you can take this stem cell and technically grow a liver cell, grow a, liver cell, grow a heart cell, or much easier, because we know the biology better, you can grow bone marrow cells. And those bone marrow cells can be either what we call lymphoid or myeloid. And what you were just discussed here is the fact that uh, lymphoid cells start young and become old. And lymphomas represent an arrested stage of maturation. In other words, we have a cell that's supposed to become a, 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 an end stage cell and die away. But in some cases, it doesn't die away and continues to um, develop. And if you have, uh, uh, you can have lymphomas of the earlier stage, and those are called acute leukemias, and then lymphomas of the older stage uh, being these low-grade lymphomas. And similarly, oh, I'm sorry, similarly, uh, you can have the myeloid cells, and we're gonna be talking about, give me this, sorry. Um, uh, these cells growing up from babies, to mature cells, and these are the ones, the mature cells are the ones that fight infection. But what if one of those cells undergoes a mistake, which I'll explain in one second, and that young cell never grows old? And all you have is an accumulation of the young cells, and by virtue of having only the young cells, you don't have the old ones to fight infection. And so a patient who comes in with leukemia, uh, acute leukemia, has a whole bunch of young cells, but none of the red cells, the platelets, the normal white cells that we need to survive. And so they come in with either bleeding because they have low platelets, very anemic because they're not making red cells, or infections because they're not making white cells. What they have is too many of the young ones and not enough of the old ones. And why should that happen? Well, this is another common concept that I'm just talking about leukemia, but it, cancers appear to be the progeny of one cell that went awry. And that cell undergoes malignant transformation. And that cell, with that, continues to proliferate, but doesn't ever grow old and die. And so you have more and more of them. I shouldn't say that they don't die, they do die, but because they're proliferating so much, if one is dying and two are growing, you can see how eventually you'll have a lot of them. And they do so at one stage because of the mistake that causes the cancer, which I'll show you in a minute, 
The cell is destined to be a lot of young cells, middle cells, or older cells. And the result is you can have a lymphoma, like we were just saying, that has different characteristics because there was a different mistake and it stopped at this point or that point. And if it stops at a cell that's growing fast, it's called an aggressive lymphoma, and slowly it, 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 it's a slower growing lymphoma. The same thing can be said for leukemia. And more importantly, not only are you making too many of these, but these tell the body you don't need the normal ones. And so you have suppression of the normal ones. And the result is that this is a mixture of cells. You can see they look different. Those are, that's a young cell, and that's an older cell, and there's some in between. And this is leukemia. And you can see they all look the same, and they all look pretty much like this cell. They're not growing up to be old, and that is acute leukemia. And you get an accumulation of these and too few of the normal ones. So why does this happen? This happens because something causes the DNA to mutate or translocate. So what was mentioned earlier, 23 chromosomes from mummy 23, uh, 20, and 23 chromosomes from daddy, so that for every gene in our body, we have a duplicate. But they're not exactly the same because one came from daddy and one came from mummy. And if one of those genes, or more than one of those genes, mutates and say that one was telling the cell to grow old, then it doesn't grow old, it's mutated. As we mentioned earlier with lymphoma, one of those genes that's very important is the BCL2 gene. And the BCL2 gene is meant to prevent the cell from dying off until it's ready to die off, and then there are certain, uh, what's called program cell death. It's very much like programmed uh, obsolescence. You buy a, a, to a toaster, and 10 years later, it isn't working anymore, all right? It's programmed that way. After you use it enough, it's enough of it. And the same thing for cells. After you use it for a while, you've got to get rid of it and start with a new cell. And so that there's, there's a way to cells to turn over and not have accumulation. And if there's a mutation, maybe these cells don't die off, as in the slow growing, or maybe there's something that tells the cell to keep growing, keep dividing, but never mature. And these, so in all cancers, we think it's a genetic mistake, okay? And certainly, obviously, we know that if you're near Chernobyl, how many people died of cancers after that because of radiation injury? Uh, but we give cancer chemotherapy every day to patients and unfortunately, while we cure most of, we cure some of them, we also damage some of them, and so that there's a higher incidence of other cancers in people who have cancer chemotherapy. And all along it goes, you see this list right here. But the result is the last big in big line, genetic mutation. In other words, the gene is changed, or the gene is moved, translocation to another area. And all the control mechanisms, you're know, supposed to have a gene right next to this one. This one's telling the gene, turn on and turn off. What if this gene is moved? Now it's always on because it doesn't have the thing that tells it to turn off, and it, ca it causes problems. And that's our theory of oncogenesis. Okay. In particular with leukemia, then we have the young, uh, those young blasts way back up here, these kind of guys right here that were supposedly destined to make all the blood cells, but a mistake happens, all of a sudden, it doesn't mature, it just keeps dividing, and you get all those young ones that I showed you. And so that you have one, excess growth or proliferation, that's the second bullet right here, excess production, but at the same time, they don't grow up, and so they have no differentiation, so you get a lot of young ones that are growing, but no old ones. And so that you present with a lack of normal cells and an excess number of these abnormal cells. And they, just like the stem cell, have an ability to keep themselves going. They don't, they don't tire out and die all off at the end. And, and then finally, what you get is not 
what you got. In other words, you start out with a cell and it was a mistake and that caused it to have leukemia, but after a while, because their abnormal mutated cells in their abnormal mutated genes, there's more mutations and so that you hear of people having cancer and then it becoming more aggressive. So what do we do? We treat it, in this case, with leukemia, with chemotherapy, in the cases of the slower growing type, we can target it with other ways, and we kill off the cells that are dividing, and we still have that famous pluripotential stem cell to regrow back. It was being suppressed, I told you, by the leukemia cells, so that what happens is you get rid of these, the normal cells grow back. And surprisingly, that happens a lot. What doesn't happen, unfortunately, is that we don't get rid of all the leukemia cells. We get rid of the ones that are growing, but the ones that are quiescent, they're sort of, think of them as the well, the stem cell of the leukemia cells, we don't kill off, and then eventually the leukemia reoccurs. So that if you look at um, survival, are we doing better? Of course we're doing better. So you see the, la the few decades um, and the average survival of newly diagnosed young people with leukemia, and it's going up and up to about 50%, which is not great, but a lot better than the 10% before. But if you notice, it's under 55. And in fact, the majority of patients with leukemia, because of we think these are accumulated mistakes over a lifetime, are actually over 55. And they do much worse. So if you, just to review, if we assume that we start out with a normal stem cell that becomes malignant, and one becomes two and two becomes four, what is represented here is that some have different colors because mista further mistakes happen. And while the chemotherapy will kill all of these, these stem cells are resistant, just like our own stem cells are resistant to chemotherapy, and they represent that well to reoccur. Now, this is leading up to the second half of this discussion, well, what, when patients reoccur, chemotherapy is never gonna work, and so that we end up having to replace the bone marrow with a transplant, which is the second half of this. But we can pretty much predict, based on um, certain predictors, as to who's going to reoccur and who's not. And if you're one of the favorable group, you see that 60% are still alive six, seven years later. And those people, we put them into remission and we wait because the majority will never come out of remission. But the vast majority, the intermediate and adverse risk groups, they're always gonna come out of remission. So as soon as they go into remission, we head into uh, this thing. I'm gonna skip over this. So the current state of treatment for leukemia, acute leukemia, is that 20, 30% are good risk we, we know day one that they're probably going to do well. They all go into remission, but they're going to stay in remission. But the other 60%, um, which are, represent the bad risk, the older patient, they're going to relapse, and what are we going to do with them? So I would ask you to press on your buttons now, and it says, just to remind you of the key facts, we said uh, current theory of causes of leukemia include all of the above except, first of all, it involves an early form of developing blood cell that goes undergoes malignant transformation. The transformation process is thought to be genetic. Uh, this leads to increase of all with normal cells or this leads to increase, the normal cells are suppressed by the leukemia clone. So you can pu push there and get, you can answer as to which one this is, and uh, I don't know if it's going. Countdown? Okay. Uh, it doesn't matter. This is just a review that's basically saying that, and uh, most people got this, are, are, are saying that we have this malignant transformation in a young cell. 
and that malignant transformation is caused by genetic mutation, and that leads to suppression of the normal cells and growth of the abnormal cells. It does not lead to increase of normal cells. Leukemia is increase of abnormal cells. Okay. The next um, one is what is our problem? Why don't we treat everybody that way, get rid of the leukemia, and everybody does fine? Well, well, is it true that the younger the patient, the worse the response? Is it true that the chemotherapy does not kill the leukemia stem cell? Is it true that rapidly growing cells are not sensitive? And is it true that all leukemia cells are exactly the same? Well, which one is not true here? And you can, you can click it in. And uh, again, for, for the interest of time, uh, yes, of course, the stem cells are this well that is not responding. And uh, the other cell, the younger cells do better, younger people do better, but most people are older. Um, rapidly growing cells are good, but the stem cells are not rapidly growing. And unfortunately, as time goes on, the leukemia cells become more malignant. Okay, so what do we do about it? Well, one of the things we can do about it is stem cell transplantation. And what does that mean? Uh, that means that um, uh, if we have a source of stem cells from somewhere else, if we can kill not only the leukemia cells, but unfortunately we want to kill the leukemia stem cells, and to do that you have to use such high doses of chemotherapy that they're going to kill your own stem cells, then how are you going to recover? Well, you give somebody else's stem cells to you. And that is an allogeneic transplant. In fact, we can do it in certain diseases like lymphoma where they may not involve the bone marrow. We can take out your own stem cells, then kill the lymphoma, and then give you back your own stem cells. And that's called an autologous transplant. And we can get those stem cells out of the bone marrow, out of the peripheral blood, because they're always circulating, uh, and even out of cord blood. And um, so the two types that I talked about are autologous and allogeneic. I'll skip the myeloablative in a minute and say that for leukemia, acute leukemia, unfortunately, your bone marrow is damaged. Your bone marrow has the leukemia. There are, you can't find those normal stem cells. They may be there, but you can't separate them out from the leukemia cells. So you're not going to find the source with yourself. So you're going to have to find a source somewhere else. All right? And first, you've got to get rid of most of the leukemia cells, put the person into remission, but we know there's a few left behind. And to get rid of those, you use very high doses of chemotherapy. And then to do that, you have to have a source of stem cells or you won't ever recover. So there's three parts to it. With it one is you're replacing this damage, the damaged or absent stem cells, um, but first you've got to get rid of the leukemia, and you've got to find that source, because if you kill the patient, kill the, all the leukemia cells and have no stem cells to go back, then he's never going to recover. And so how do we know how this is a match? It's a very complicated thing, but suffice it to say that all in our body, we have proteins on the surface of our cells that recognize ourselves. And each one of us has a unique set of proteins that our immune system says, oh, you're OK, but that bacteria doesn't have it. We'll get rid of it. All right? so, so it's not autoimmune. It goes after somebody else's immunity. And if we're going to give these stem cells, we've got to find people who ha look like you. And that would happen in maybe 1 in 20, 1 in 30,000 people. And so you, unless it's your brother or sister, and then sh by sheer genetics, it's 1 in 4. So you people who have br four brothers and sisters, there's a pretty good chance that the, one of them will be a match. But if you don't, because in the United States today, we only have 2.1 siblings, uh, 2.1 children per family. So if you only have 1.1 sibling to match with you by, on the average. Everybody understand that statement? We don't have brothers and sisters, all right? We have small families now. 
And so we've got to find somebody by sheer uh, mixing of the genetics that looks like you and, um, and then get their stem cells, kill your bone marrow, give them back your stem cells. And that has proven to be a big problem, but getting better. So who do we find? Well, if we find your sibling, that's called a matched related donor. If it comes from somebody else, it's called a matched unrelated donor. So we find somebody who matches you, but he's totally unrelated. And finally, we have an almost un inexhaustible supply of cord blood. So in this day and age, if um, many of the cord, the blood of uh, babies, you know, uh, comes out of the cord, you cut the cord and you can drain the placenta of a certain number of cells. And because the baby is young and making a lot of cells, they have a lot of stem cells in there. And since we have millions of babies born per year, you can store them away. The problem is one cord is not enough to give to an adult, but you can find two or three and you can do it. So using that fact, um, we are having more and more transplants being done. And uh, you see that the, uh, the, in the green here, which is the unrelated, the related, the number per year has gone up slightly, but in the unrelated, the number is rising because we have more and more people. And how does that happen? Well, suppose you have leukemia and your sister and brother come in and give blood, and it turns out they're not a match for you. They go into the donor pool. If you hear these people that are having donor drives, kid has leukemia, please come down and give blood. They take 100, 200 people. If they're not a match, they go into the donor pool. And eventually we have millions of people in the donor pool. And it's kept in a, in a bank. And um, this is um, uh, uh, the number of transplants that have been going up from 1980 where there are practically none two or four or 5,000 a year of um, related and unrelated donors. The blue line is autologous. And so what we're doing much more now is if you don't have, you, you can store away your own stem cells as long as your bone marrow is not involved, say give the high dose chemotherapy to kill that, that lymphoma that didn't die off and give you back your stem cells. Uh, so it's an easier source because it's your own. So just to be sure, and we'll be finished in two minutes, you understand that this is not for the faint of heart. When I tell you you have to give huge doses of chemotherapy to kill off the leukemia, the, the lymphoma cells that didn't die off with the regular amount of chemotherapy, it comes over to five to 10 times the dose, which causes damage to every organ in the body and kills off your only your normal stem cells, so then, and then you give back your normal stem cells. So we do not do this in people who generally are over 70 years of age because it's too toxic, but we're working on ways of not giving this much chemotherapy, and uh, suffice it to say, remember I showed you myeloabative, um, Myeloablative means you ablate the bone marrow with chemotherapy. Non-myeloablative says we get you into remission. We don't give you any more chemotherapy. We give you back the stem cells, and we hope that the stem cells from somebody else will attack your lymphoma cells because they recognize it as malignant. And it happened, and it amazingly works. So I want to get towards the end here. Uh, the transplant is just to rescue. You're giving back the stem cells. You had to get rid of the leukemia or the lymphoma. And so what we do is give enough chemotherapy that kills all the blood cells. That's a, that's a white blood cell count. We give back the stem cells a few days later after the chemo's out of your system. Seven days later, the barrel grows back. But what happens? is the chemotherapy hurts other organs. The stem cells, if they're not a perfect match, will attack your body as if it's, just remember I told you how you have these uh, proteins on your surface of your cells to, to tell you that they're your own and not somebody else's? Well, if there's any mismatch, 
this, the immune cells that are been coming from the donor say, hey, I don't like this, and they attack yourself, and that's called graft versus host. The graft may not grow, and you still may have relapse. So this is the last thing. Yeah, we got a lot of problems, and we've got to work on getting the disease down to a minimum on this side. And yeah, older people don't tolerate it. And yeah, there's toxicity. But what there is, is what we can do, is if we can get more people in the donor pool, and they're better matches, they can stand to get through this whole process. And so we talk to lay people as saying, if you, and may I add, we don't take too many people over 65 years of age, um, but um, if you're in the donor pool, if you're, somebody says, uh, uh, ask for a donor, it's all they're asking for is a blood to test you, and then one day somebody's going to turn out to be a match for you, and then they can take your stem cells literally from the blood, you're not hurt, and those stem cells can give life. So we push this idea of uh, increasing the donor pool. And we have millions, but we need millions more. Uh, I'll give you an example why we need millions more. It's real easy if you're of white European ancestry. But if you're a white European ancestry, if your mother was from, uh, was from England and your father was from Africa, well, now you're blended. And that, that um, mixture of proteins is not going to be seen in, in, in the white Europeans anymore. You're going to have to be looking for people who are, have mixed parentage. And so we need millions and millions for all the, all the mixed parentages that we have in the United States. And by the way, there's a Taiwanese tumor uh, registry. There's a Chinese registry for, so that we go to those if you're of Chinese ancestry or whatever. You don't start looking in the, in the, in the European ancestry. Okay. And the result of which is these are the unrelated transplants every year going up because we have more and more people. And um, you can see that for things like um, the blue is allogeneic and green is autologous, you can see for leukemia, we need to have some source elsewhere. But for other cancers, we can use our own bone marrow. So questions for to be answered? Uh, types of allogeneic bone marrow donors are your sibling, your own stem cells, uh, an unrelated person's bone marrow, an umbilical cord blood. You can, you can um, uh, vote, uh, but I'm going to move for right away and say if it's uh, all of the above. The only one that's not is B. Okay, should have been. The one that's not here is your own stem cells. You got all got it right. Congratulations. Um, um, the complications of the transplant uh, of an allogeneic, but not an autologous, high doses of chemotherapy, graft versus host, relapse and infection. Which one is seen only in allogeneic and not in autologous? And uh, you can vote. And again, it's graft versus host is what's not seen in autologous because it's your own stem cells. Everything else, because we use high-dose chemo, um, causes problems. Um, I, I, I think we're going to move on here because we're... I didn't give you a chance because we're, it's, it's a little complicated, that one. So finally, increased number of transplants that are being performed now compared to before is related to the number of donors, the ability to handle the complications, the ability to select better. Oh, by the way, we have enough donors. So the one that isn't, remember, the one that isn't um, related to why we're making more is obviously going to be D. That is, we don't have enough donors. Everything else, we're getting around. Okay, so I will uh, stop there and ask questions. So what we've tried...